So hello everyone, I'm Yubi Hernandez. I am the new roster director for GFS. We are a 20 year old organization that started with the purpose of serving young um, 18, 14 to 18 year olds and teaching them the fundamentals of storytelling through filmmaking. And it is really exciting to be able to say that we have been able to accomplish so much for the past 20 years. So in my department, we serve the alumni and young professionals. Um, we are a talent pipeline for the industry. And so it's very exciting to have you all here learn more about E1, not only for their incredible productions, but also for the opportunities that they have in store. So I'm going to hand it off now to Darren, um, who is the CEO and president of E1 and allow him to introduce himself. Thank you all for being here. Great, thank you, Yubi. Hi everyone, I'm Darren Troop. I'm the president and CEO of E1. It's really great to be here and I'm thrilled that you can join us today. So on behalf of everyone at E1 and Hasbro, we are big fans of the Ghetto Film School and the great work that you all do. Hasbro started supporting back in 2017 with the LA, with the LA Fellows Program. And now we're excited to build on that great partnership and expand our support of the Fellows Program to New York and London in addition to LA. At Hasbro and E1, we really want to invest in the next generation of storytellers. We want to give all young people the opportunity to be creative, build new skills and find success in this business. This is why we're proud to partner with the Ghetto Film School and meet with you all today. So E1 is Hasbro's entertainment arm. We're a global studio that produces content across film, TV, family programming, podcasts, AR, VR, and even live entertainment. In a moment, I'll introduce our great panelists representing E1 today. But first, let's take a look at the awesome stories they've helped bring to audiences around the world. So I hope you're familiar with some of that content. Today, we're, we're all gonna share some insights with you about how that content gets made and advice for how you can be part of this industry. So let's get started. So first, you're gonna tell us your name, what you do at E1 and brought you here. So we're gonna start with our panelists and we've got a number of really um, experienced panelists with us, not old, just experienced. And we're gonna start with Chris. So Chris, we'll start with you and then I want you to pass it on to the next panelist, please. Great, sure. Um, well, hi, everybody. Thanks so much for having us. It's uh, such a thrill to be here today. Uh, my name is Chris Bell. I'm the Vice President of Scripted Development for Canada. So as Darren mentioned, E1 is a global studio. In terms of our television business, we've got, you know, hubs in LA, in London, and in Toronto, Canada, and that's where I'm based. This is actually a Canadian moose red moose over my shoulder here. Um, so I'm part of a team that really is, is looking for and developing great projects uh, out of Canada. So working with Canadian talent, working on Canadian IP as the basis for great scripted series ideas uh, and taking that to market both you know, in Canada and ultimately globally around the world. Um, I started my career in feature film. Uh, I started as a uh, producer of feature film working in independent production. I worked with filmmakers like Denis Villeneuve and uh, Fernando Morales and Don McKellar uh, before really making the move into television uh, where I, I worked as a broadcaster. So I worked in Canada. We have a private broadcasting company called Chorus Entertainment. Uh, and I worked as a production executive and then ultimately uh, headed up their original programming in the series space. I did that for about six years and then I moved over to E1 and I, I'm having my fifth year anniversary actually today. Um, so it's hard to believe it's been five years, but uh, I started in current programming for E1 and, and the way that we organize ourselves as a studio is that current program, programming is really kind of, you know, looking over our active production series that are sort of in prep or, you know, shooting or in post. I started there and then uh, about two years ago, I migrated to go over to the development side. Um, so that's that's a little bit about me and I think now I'll hand it over to Dor Thanks, Chris. Hi everyone, I'm Dora Gondolaria. I am EVP of Marketing and Publicity for E1 for film and television. And um, I wear a few hats for what we do because we kind of do a lot of different things in our marketing and PR department. 
uh, one of the things we do is work with our different partners that release our films. So whether it's, um, you know, we have a partnership with Amblin and work on their films. We have partnerships with Paramount on the Hero titles, or we do co-fis with movies like Clifford or Happiest Season with Sony. So I work with those partners to make sure they're representing our brand correctly. We collaborate on the strategy for those marketing and publicity on those films. And um, I also work with the territories for our company because we have offices and we also release movies in Benelux in Australia. So I work with all of the territories in those countries on their strategy for releasing those films. Um, and then we also, well, also while our films are in production, I work with Zev and his group and the Sierra Affinity Group on how those films are going to be marketed and the PR that's happening during that period as well. So it's a few different hats. And then there's sometimes things come up internally, like we just marketed the film My Little Pony along with Netflix. So we'll oversee the marketing and PR of that film um, along with Netflix when things like that come up and they're a corporate wide initiative with the brand and with Hasbro. So. I uh, started my career in college. Um, I kind of, I was a broadcast major at Arizona State and I discovered um, regional field publicity through a film critic who I worked with at a TV station. And he was very much like, you definitely should be in PR, <laughs> which I did not know what a film publicist was, but he pegged me right away and he was right. I loved it. Um, so I worked in regional PR for a few years and then I always had planned to move to LA my whole life. So moved to LA when I was 25 to work for Disney. I worked in home entertainment for a few years, then moved to US theatrical PR at Disney, went over to Paramount for a few years. And then at Paramount, I moved into international PR and eventually became head of international publicity at Paramount. Um, and after 11 years at Paramount, I made the leap over to E1 and I've uh, been at E1 for three years and it's been great. And I will let uh, jump the ball over to Zev. Hi, uh, thanks Dora. I'm Zev Foreman. I'm the president of film production at E1. Um, my job basically involves overseeing the creative development from sort of initial stage all the way through production of, of our entire film slate which includes uh, not only all of our independent stuff that we do across E1, but all the Hasbro films as well. Um, and all the films we do with our partners that Dora mentioned previously, like Transformers or GI Joe that we have with Paramount or some of these other bigger bigger projects, um, Dungeons and Dragons, which we just did. Um, we also work a lot with our CP team um, on the Hasbro side in terms of like the creative development and how it kind of uh, uh, combines with with the consumer product side and, and, and that piece of the business, um, which has been a really, really amazing um, and different kind of thing for, I think, of all, a lot of us um, since, the, since the merger of the two companies. Um, I rep in Northern California, um, came to LA for law school, um, never really intended to be in film, um, but here I am. So uh, it's been an amazing journey. And, and then the last uh, three years for myself at E1 as well have been fantastic and, and watching the company uh, Kind of expand and 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 really um, kind of work their way into these amazing projects. Everything from like small amazing dramas to these giant big tentpole movies is has been a kind of a, a a fantastic thing to see. So we're really excited about about what we're doing and excited to to share that with you guys. So and I think I'm sending it to Gabe. Thanks, Ab. Um, hey, I'm Gabe Morano. I am uh, the EVP of Scripted TV, based here in LA. Um, I've actually only been at the company since this summer, um, the, though uh, in my roles of when working at networks before this, I got to make shows with E1 and Jackie and I got to work together and, uh, and we were in the trenches together. So I felt coming, even though it's a new company to me, it felt like family when I got here. So uh, I, uh, I oversee the, the Hasbro properties within the scripted TV division. Um, among other things, but, you know, sort of like Zev spent a lot of time uh, working both on creative development and strategy for building properties around D&D &D and Power Rangers and, and a whole host of other things. Um, you know, I, I grew up in New York and I, I went to college in New York 
and did, I started out doing a lot of internships and, and production on the feature side and, and working for quirky indie filmmakers, but, but it was definitely sort of, you know, a, a grab bag of work as much as much cool movies as industrials. And then suddenly I found myself doing commercials and producing hip hop videos. And as cool as it is to produce a DMX video, it'll also shave 10 years off your life. So at a certain point I realized maybe it's time to pop over to LA and see what they have in store. And um, thought I was gonna be getting back into the film business and, until somebody pointed out that um, uh, the scripted TV business was pretty cool. And I went to work at a, uh, an independent TV studio uh, uh, that was based at Fox where we were doing shows like The Shield and and uh, like a lot of stuff for FX that like, and it was sort of the early days of cool basic cable kind of scripted TV. So uh, I fell in love with that, got to like to work, like, did this show called Burn Notice and The Americans for FX. Um, and then after a bunch of years of doing that, tried my, tried a shot at the network side of things where like to see what it was like to be a buyer and learned that it's really stressful to be a buyer because every like it's you know um everybody's paying attention to those decisions and it is a lot more fun to make things so I was at a I worked on a show called Bates Motel at A&E then I was over at Fox where we're working on big commercial Ryan Murphy shows like 911 and and when I knew it was time to be on the side of making things and building things, that's when I had the sense to come over here and join you on. I am now going to turn it over to Jackie. Hi, um, I'm Jackie Cesari. I'm also uh, the other EVP of scripted television uh, in LA with Gabe. Um, I oversee the non-Hasbro uh, developments uh, through our production companies. We have a lot of production company deals, which we can talk to you guys about. Um, I also oversee uh, Yellow Jackets and Cruel Summer, which was our, our shows that came out this year. And I actually started, I'm from Southeast LA, uh, and I went to UCLA and I just started as an intern, uh, getting paid nothing for a long time making photocopies. And it's kind of why I love this business so much because it really is, you know, uh, it's a, it's the great equalizer. And it's one of those that you really truly can just start at the bottom. Um, so I was uh, an intern at Fox Searchlight. I was really snobby and snooty about my film taste. Uh, and then I worked at a company called Warner Independent. Um, and then, you know, the financial crisis happened 2008, no one could get a job and I got recruited to be an agent, which is very weird, but actually turned out to be a, a really great experience for me. So I was an agent at CA for eight years. Uh, I was in the film group and then the TV group and everyone similar to Gabe had been telling me, you should go into TV, TV is a great business. It's a great industry. The people are so nice, no offense to my film brethren, but uh, I made the jump and I, I fell in love with it. I absolutely love the TV business. So I was an agent in TV and then I went to, I, I missed being a producer. I actually went to work with Mark Gordon uh, where I um, we started the relationship with E1 and Designated Survivor was my first show um, and then got acquired by E1 fully in 2018 and have been here ever since and, and really loving it and through the Hasbro acquisition as well. So that's my story. Sorry, and I'm Thanks. taking it to Tenny. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, no worries. Thanks, Jackie. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Tenny Spitzer, and I lead human resources for the film and television group globally. Um, I've been at E1 now for two and a half years. Time has flown. It's been a ride. It's been great. Um, I've, you know, HR, a lot of people think of as, um, you know, hiring, but we hopefully are known for more than that. at leaders of the organization and the business to help drive the people's strategy. We talked about the uh, sort of what I would say the employee experience. I've been in the HR arena 
since I graduated business school about 21 years ago. <laughs> and HR, um, you could, as you can imagine, you could do it in a number of any industry, really. Um, you know, I started mine in big oil, very exciting at ExxonMobil, and, I, and it was a great training ground, but I learned pretty quickly that you have to get excited about the product <laughs> that, you, uh, that you work on and you, you're with. So I um, jumped ship, went to Yahoo. I was at Yahoo for a couple of years. Um, they were going through a number of uh, interesting reorgs and restructures, and that got painful after a while. So I moved on to Paramount Pictures. I was there for about four years supporting the film group. Um, been, you know, realized I really enjoy working with creative people um, and, and sort of this non-linear thinking way of approaching, uh, you know, uh, you know the, the work. So I, you know, um, definitely drawn back to that. So um, after Paramount, I went to Thomson Reuters for a bit. I was there uh, working more, again, media, but more in the technology space and then back at E1. So now, you know, back in entertainment with E1. So very excited, um, you know, to be here, very excited to talk to you guys about careers in this space. So with that, I will pass it on to my colleague, Ali Torres. Hi everyone, I'm Ali Torres. Um, I'm the HR manager for the US region here at E1 based in Santa Monica, reporting to Tenny. Um, I've been here for a little over two years and yeah, like Tenny said, we're really trying to make sure that there's a good employee experience, partner with the business to um, really develop the talent um, and create opportunities internally, externally. Um, I do a lot of partnership with um, you know, our other call HR colleagues in Canada, um, but do mostly focus on the US region. Um, something we've been working on that we started last or last spring, I guess, is our intern program. So that's really an area of focus for me right now, um, which is why I'm excited to talk to the Ghetto Film School. Um, I had been briefly introduced to the Ghetto Film School last year, um, kind of when we were already in the midst of our program. Um, so I'm excited to see what we can do together for this summer. Um, I've been doing HR for a little over seven years. Uh, always have been in the entertainment space, kind of fell into it. I was born and raised in Southern California, so naturally kind of migrated to LA where there's a lot of opportunities. Um, and yeah, I've been at like a digital media company. I went to, over to a TV network. I was at A&E at the same time as Gabe actually, um, and then did a little bit in, um, in music publishing and then uh, VFX, so post-production, um, which then I came back full circle to film and TV. So um, kind of like Tenny, like I really enjoy doing what I do, but it is, it is very much like a business function at times. And I do like to be what I call like creative adjacent, <laughs> um, to what's going on in the business and that keeps things exciting and interesting. And, um, yeah, so nice to meet everybody here and looking forward to talking. Oh, I think I'm the last person. So back to you, B. <laughs> Well, thank you everyone for those wonderful introductions. I feel like I learned so much, not only about E1 and Hasbro, of course, but about the different roles and how important they are into the production and the making of TV. Um, and so if, Darren, if you um, wouldn't want to say anything else, I'm happy to open up the breakout rooms. No, please open up the breakup rooms. Thank you for doing this. And, and thanks to all my, my fellow E1ers for taking the time to do this as well. Um, do any of the participants have a question they would like to start with for the broader team? Oh, yeah. um, uh, so can you put your hand up just so I can call you? All right, Andrea, please start. Oh, yeah. From the uh, remote perspective, the will work be remote, or do we have to pick an office headquarters to work at <laughs> if we were to apply for a job there? E one. Where's Darren? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we need to get Darren or HR. I think this is a good one for you. We're all pretty remote a lot of the time. <laughs> yeah, uh, Ali, do you want to? Speaking yeah, I, I was going to say, um, I mean, right now, E1's observing a hybrid kind of work environment. So that includes 
a couple days at the office, one or two, if people are comfortable or mostly at home. I think it depends on the role, the responsibilities, what the job duty really is. Um, but I think people have been coming in and enjoy, have been enjoying coming in like one or two days a week. So I think the short answer is that it would depend. I don't know if that <laughs> clarifies. It, yeah. And I also would add to, you know, we had our, Allie mentioned at the beginning of the call, like that we had our um, pilot summer intern program that we had this last summer. For example, we had, because everybody was remote at the time, we were able to bring in interns from everywhere. So we had interns from different states and locations. I, I just think, you know, moving forward, it is a little bit of a TBD because we have to sort of see like how close can you be to a close enough office so at least you could pop in for collaboration, you know, as needed. So yeah, yeah. we'll really let you know when Darren things. comes back on. And, we'll ask <laughs> and I was going to say, there's nothing that can really re fully replace in-person collaboration and experiences together. So um, while we're definitely able to do that virtually and we've proven that, I think there is a key aspect to like being together in one space. Um, Harold, please. Hi, um, Chris, I really love that you, uh, and Jacqueline, I really love that you shared about stepping down and vertical moves. Can everyone hear me? Okay, yeah, uh, that's really affirming. <laughs> so thanks for sharing that. Um, I wanted to ask, what do you, what do you guys love mo most about working at E1? I mean, I, I'll just go. I mean, I I've worked at several places, and honestly, the people it's uh, it's like a really, really, really good group of people, and you have a lot of freedom and autonomy. You know, I think because Darren is such an entrepreneur, like he literally built this, you know, himself um, by probably taking risks and doing things that people probably didn't think were smart moves at the time that turned it into very lucrative moves. I think it's uh, hiring people that you trust, that are creative, that are ambitious, that have an entrepreneurial spirit, and then kind of letting them do their thing. So it's been really, really fun in that there's not a lot of you know, bureaucracy and red tape. And um, it's just, it feels like a, we're, we're nimble, we're small, um, but we're all like best at what we do. I will just offer, you know, sort of a the sort of Canadian, a Canadian perspective on, on E1, which is I love, you know, I think we're a, a big, small company and a small, big company. And I, I feel like at times in a really good way, it can feel like you're working for kind of a small boutique, you know, company that it feels sort of intimate. And at other times, you know, you can re you really feel the kind of global reach of E1. And I, you know, I think we're, we have, you know, meetings every Monday where we're running through, you know, our entire slate and whether it's a small half hour comedy that we're developing out of Canada or, you know, Jackie's updating us on like yellow jackets, you know, it's, it's the same brain trust across all of our slate. And so I, I find I'm learning something, you know, every day working here from, from you know other other parts of the business or other people from other teams, um, that sort of that global aspect is is amazing. But I also I also like that it can it, it can feel small and and boutique and intimate and sort of you know um, talent focused and creative focused all at the same time. So and the other thing I would just say you know. Zev is here and I would, one of the cool things about the size of this company, I've worked at a lot of companies that had big feature divisions and big television divisions and the interaction between the two of them was pretty minimal, like that not, not great communication or it was like a real sort of firewall between the two. And it is, it's, it's, it's great just from a from a working environment, from an information standpoint, and just like, and expanding, expanding, like what we consider our colleagues is the fact that we just do communicate. And like, we are in meetings together, we share information, they tell us things that are just like, super helpful for how we do it. I think that's a, I think that's kind of a superpower of a company like this. It's amazing at some of the bigger places that nobody communicates kids with each other in that way, especially in this day and age, I would say TV and film are sort of doing this, right? You know, and, and you know, we always joke, <laughs> we joke a lot between each other about like, 
you know, what people care about more nowadays. And, you know, I think there's a lot of, uh, a lot of different kind of conversations and, you know, I just kind of say like, at the end of the day, we're kind of doing a lot of the same thing right now. And cause our stuff is ending up in a lot of the same places. And, you know, so like when someone, you know, flips on their, you know, TV and, and puts Netflix on, like when they choose to watch a film or they choose to watch a series where they can stream every episode in a row, like, what's the difference, right? You know what I mean? And, and this is a scary thing for the business. It's also a great thing for the business. Um, so I think that, you know, for us to be aligned, especially when it comes to like some of these sort of bigger pieces of content and, and, and how audiences engage with them. Um, I mean, you look at like Disney as an example, maybe a really good example where, you know, they have films like Marvel and then they have TV series or you have Star Wars, you have this, you have that, you have all these different things. You have online stuff, you have, you know, unscripted things that they're, you know, like fans when they're excited about stuff kind of want to engage in a lot of things in a lot of different ways. And I think, you know, for us, you know, in order to make that experience, you know, of high quality and also, um, consistent, you know, across the, 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 the brand, if we're working on certain brands in that way, I think it's, it makes it so much easier when we talk and we talk multiple times a week about a lot of different things. And I think that's, that's, again, I think a strength of, 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 as, as, as Chris also said, the idea that the company can be a little bit smaller and, and more nimble. Um, and, you know, right now that, you know, there's a lot of people that kind of look at studios and they go, Hmm, I'm not sure that's where I want to be right now. You know what I mean? Like, you know, it's, it's, you know, that, and I think that, that we are, we are lucky. Um, and I think that also I would say that not just, you know, to tout E1, but there's a lot of opportunity right now outside of like the big places, you know, there's, there's a lot of opportunity for people to, to do things in different ways. Um, and I think that's, that's a great sort of, evolution of, of the content business at the moment, you know, um, because it's not all locked up inside of these giant companies everywhere. You know, I think, you know, there, there are definitely other ways to access things, other ways to create stuff. And, and that's kind of an exciting time for all of us, I think. So. Thank you so much, guys. Does anyone else have a question they would love to ask? But um, as a viewer myself, I can say that your company culture really comes through. And I think that that's something that really demonstrate, demonstrates itself not only in having this session, but also the kinds of uh, content that you create. So it, it really is amazing to have you here and to have you share your knowledge and expertise with our participants. The pleasure is ours. Yeah, I would for say. sure. Yeah. Any more questions? Um, so can you, um, I guess I'm going to go with the questions that we pre-prepped, if that's okay. Mm -hmm. um, Chris and Jacqueline, and I'll go through a question for each of the teams. Um, can you talk through the various stages of TV series from development to production? Sorry, was, who is this to? Is this to me? Oh, um, I was saying that, why don't we start with you, Jacqueline and Chris, okay. and, um, and then I can ask a question to each of the teams. Sure, you wanna start from how do we go from development to the screen? Yes. Is that the question? Um, sure, so we can just, um, I'll give you, you know, an example, right? So, um, so for Yellow Jackets, uh, and this is usually how it, it plays, um, you know, we heard that as a pitch just from the writers. So we have a deal with, uh, with this young producer, her name is Drew Cummins, who I had worked with in the film side. And again, this is another thing I will say. I love, I love giving, you know, advice that doesn't seem obvious, but it really is this business. So much of it is based on networking and friendships. So even if you guys don't know each other on this Zoom, get to know each other. You have something in common already. You were all on the Zoom. So uh, stay in touch. <laughs> and uh, so I had stayed in touch with Drew a really long time. He had heard that uh, UTA was taking out this pitch. So uh, we, we chased it, we heard it, we loved it. And we had to compete with other studios to get it. Uh, then we got, we got the pitch and it was, you know, 
it was rough. It was actually, the girls were set in the, it was set in the seventies. It was a two time period, seventies and nineties, you know, um, it was, a, it was, but we saw that the writers had such a strong vision. So we further developed that pitch and then we, you know, the, the studio develops yeah. it um, before taking it out to buyers. And you can either develop it as a pitch where you go in person and you actually, you know, verbally tell them what the series is and what the story is, and you get a buyer to attach that way, or you write a script internally, right? We could write a script internally um, and maybe attach talent to it or attach a director. But in this case, we just went out with a, with a pitch. Uh, we took it out to all the networks. Uh, it's basically about a week or two uh, in, in LA straight, just driving to every single one of them. You go to Apple, you go to Netflix, you go and you do your whole song and dance for them. Now that it's COVID, we do it on Zoom, which is actually great. <laughs> I don't do with parking or traffic or any of that. Um, and then, you know, Showtime beat out the other places. So, um, and then once you're at Showtime, you then go through the process again. So now you further develop it with the network. And so we get, we then got a pilot script in, in really good shape. We attached Karin Kusama, um, we did a, a presentation. They thought that was good enough to, do, to shoot a pilot. So then we shot a pilot. Um, that was two years ago, and then they delivered on the pilots, and uh, and then we picked it up to series. So it that was a long process, but usually it goes something like like that, I would say. Um, but Gabe and Chris can give you many different examples, but that's just one. Yeah, I'll offer just a quick a quick sort of alternate path, which is you know obviously IP is such a huge part of our business, and Gabe and and Jackie and I are you know across lots of different lists that get generated in one internally book list. You know, we're looking at plays. Um, we, uh, we had read a book, um, I had read a book in school called The Edible Woman. Margaret Atwood is one of our, you know, in the pantheon of sort of great Canadian authors, global authors. Um, and obviously Handmaid's Tale is, you know, a series that I, I've loved. And um, we caught wind that uh, a feature producer in Canada had the rights to her first novel called The Edible Woman, which is sort of a small story set up in the 60s in Toronto about a woman who, when her boyfriend proposes to her, it sort of triggers a, a bit of an identity crisis. And she's kind of looking to her life and seeing the lanes kind of becoming narrower and narrower. And reading the book, you know, at the time that Trump just got into office and there was the women's marches, marches in Washington, and it just felt like how much has changed and how much hasn't changed is kind of the looming question you had when you were reading the book. And we thought, I think there's more than a feature here. I think this feels like it could be more than that. And uh, so we, you know, worked with the producers, convinced them that there was potential here. We optioned uh, the book. Uh, we brought on board Margot Robbie's production company, Lucky Chap. We really auditioned many, many writers, Canadian writers, you know, US writers, uh, European writers. We're looking for just a really inventive take. This was period, this was internal. So it really needed, we needed a big creative idea to kind of unlock it. And uh, this British writer blew us away with this idea of weaving in a contemporary timeline that really kind of distilled this idea of how much has changed and how much hasn't looking at consumer culture in the sixties versus consumer culture today, you know, women's bodies as sites of consumption uh, issues of gender identity, all of the stuff that's, you know, obviously so much in the zeitgeist in the conversation culturally today. Uh, and through this kind of uniquely kind of Atwood tone, it just felt like such a fresh, exciting take. So, you know, we uh, partnered up with this writer. She kind of crafted this incredible pitch. Uh, and now we're, we're taking it out uh, wide in the market. So, uh, that's another example just of you know us kind of out there kind of hunting IP, looking for IP as sort of the basis for for great television ideas. Thank you, Chris. And I think that actually makes a great transition. So like once you have this incredible story and once you have this product like a pilot, how do you how, what is the process for for the various stages for developing a marketing plan? Um, Dora, could you please? elaborate how you would do that? <laughs> um, sure. I, you know, for, I can talk about it in a, in broad strokes, you know, with our company, it's a little bit different because we develop it along with partners, right? So, you know, even for Yellow Jackets, it's at Showtime. So it's, it's a partnership, but um, recently 
we had My Little Pony I will talk about because while we had a partnership with Netflix, that was a corporate wide initiative because we were doing a relaunch on that brand, right? It was brand new characters. Um, it was a brand new book. It was 3D animation versus 2D. It was characters no one had ever heard of. And also My Little Pony in the zeitgeist of everyone was not as popular as it used to be. And so, and it's an important brand to this company, not just for little girls. It's a brand that was for girls and boys and teenagers and men and women. And, and we needed it to be back to where it was. And where that film originally started was going to be released theatrically with Paramount. And because of COVID and everything that happened, that was going on around there, um, that wasn't going to be the best place for it to be. And so there was a deal with Netflix, but the, the thing with releasing on a streamer is that they don't market off platform usually, unless they're Disney plus <laughs> or Amazon in, in certain instances, but, um, but also their marketing is very late because as you all probably are aware, when as a consumer of streaming, if you see something for a streaming show or movie advertised, it means that it's available now. Right. It's very, very rare that you're going to see something marketed for a streaming show or, or movie where it's like, oh, this is a, an amazing show or movie that's coming out in two months on Netflix or Amazon or Hulu. It's the pattern for people who are consuming streaming is immediate. You know, people I got feedback on Yellow Jackets for people I sent to go watch it and they were super angry that there was only two episodes. Right. Because the habit for everybody now is to binge. Right. They were like, what do you don't send me to shows that don't have the whole series on there, right? Like it's, so that's, um, that's the habit of everyone. And we had partners and retailers and, you know, licensing groups and all of these people who originally had been told that this My Little Pony movie was going to have this theatrical release. And what comes along with that from a marketing perspective is outdoor media and, you know, digital and TV buys and big PR push and all of those things that come along with that. And when it goes to a streamer, while being on a streamer is great for repeat movie watching, which is fantastic for toy buying because it creates great connection for kids and families and people. And My Little Pony, by the way, does ha continues to have repeat watching. I can tell you even in my own household, <laughs> I'm sure Zev can too. Um, it needed all the pre-awareness that wasn't going to come along with streaming. So, you know, our own internal group stepped up to the plate and we talked to Netflix and said, we need the ability to co-market this, basically market this ourselves globally. And it starts with basically every single bit of, you know, starts with material and talent, the talent in the film. So, you know, and the messaging, right? Like, what are we trying to say about the product and the film? Uh, together, uh, especially on a relaunch. And so it can start as early as just announcing the film, which is what the first thing we did was, you know, we got the cast together and announced the movie and put out a logo. And that is a stamp on what the movie and is going to say and look like. And, you know, you put together a timeline of like the trailer and the poster and a timeline of PR events. And you put together, okay, if I am going to spend money on buying media, where am I going to buy it? And how am I going to buy it? And by the way, the marketplace is different. It, you know, there were, when we talked about what the benefits of working at E1 in the breakout, when we were just talking about one of the things I said was very similar to it. You know, everyone was saying about working at a company that was very nimble at a studio, you have about 30 people that you have to run things past, right? You know, can everybody approve this shade of pink that's going to go in this rainbow that we're about to put on this logo for this brand? And while we did have to do that because it's an important brand, it was by like three people, right? And not by 30. And same with the media plan, right? Like when we were ready to buy it and my team was like, okay, here's the best things we should be doing, right? This is all, this is where the digital things are happening and this is what's online and this is the great, best thing for social. And for a second, I was like, okay, who do I need to run this by? Oh, nobody, I'm the decision maker. Okay, let's go. <laughs> like, you guys all think this is great. I trust my team. So we're gonna just go. and. It was, a, it was an amazing thing because after 20 plus years at studios, you never have that moment where you're just like, yeah, sure, let's do it. Like, this is the right thing. 
this is the this is the best thing for the movie let's move forward and um this won't be a surprise to you guys but TikTok obviously is very important, but it was uh, it was an uphill battle because it is a very risky thing right now. TikTok is for uh, family movies just because they don't have they still don't have all of the gateways in place. You have to be very careful when and you'll you'll see everyone from Disney to Viacom to everyone of how they are on TikTok. We did feel like TikTok was important for My Little Pony if we wanted to be in pop culture and just not. In, with kids. Um, moms are all about TikTok, young moms. And so we fought hard internally to be on there. And it was a huge part of our marketing campaign. So those are also some of the strategic things that we talk about, like where's the best place to spend our money. And it, it was a lot of also internal discussions with people because they, there are some people who are like, why aren't we on traditional TV? which we call linear TV, right? Like, why aren't we on doing commercials on television and, and us educating people saying nobody watches television, right? <laughs> like kids are watching YouTube and they watch what we call, you know, platform television. People are watching Amazon and Roku and, you know, in your own household, who is watching regular television? And if they are, it's DVR, so who's watching the commercials? So where's the where's the money best spent and how is it best spent and where are you and then we talk about social amplification and everybody's favorite word influencers and how they can help the campaign so it's multifaceted right everywhere from PR to marketing to creative and all the along the way working with the brand and the filmmakers to make sure we're on message with everybody and on a product like that working with the toy group to make sure that we're doing what they need also to uplift the, the toy sales um, and make sure it goes along with, are they going to have toys on shelves when we're doing all of this, right? Is it matching up to when they're going to be on set and are we all on the same page? And, and this is in every major country in the world, not just the U.S. So um, that's kind of how we would approach different, different, product, different films and different projects, but that's an example. Thank you so much, Dora. That was really great analysis of how to tie in a product so important at, at Hasbro. I had my own My Little Ponies growing up <laughs> um, with your company and the content that you create. I guess um, because we're at Roster and we're always thinking about how do we get our talent um, into these amazing projects. Um, Tenny and Ali, would you mind um, mentioning, mentioning a little bit about like what advice you would give a roster member in getting their foot at the door so that they can become part of the team for My Little Pony or for Yellow Jackets or for any of the content that you create? Sure. Do you, Ali, you want me to start? I'll start and then um, please chime in. Yeah, I, I think, um, well, first, the first step I would say is we post all of our roles um, on Entertainment One Careers website on our website. So you should always, um, you know, put a um, notifier or whatever and be able to go in and like see what's out there because we do post all of our roles. Um, and so, you you know, if there's something you're interested in, then you apply directly and it goes straight to our recruiting team we post on LinkedIn so there's a sort of way that we go out into the market by just you know um, what most companies do but then there's this other sort of piece I think that you know we touched on a lot in all of our breakout rooms and it's a lot around relationship building and networking and it's so important and I can't uh, uh, highlight that enough in my career you know I'll tell you that um, the times you want to network is actually like when you're not even looking for an opportunity. I think it's important to build these foundational relationships as you grow in your career. And so that you're not like tapping into someone when you need something, um, but they remember you. And when you, you know, when you're looking for your next gig, um, they know, and they're like thinking about you for that opportunity. I think it's just important to start early and start, you know, um, and, and everywhere you are, I mean, there's an opportunity to network. I think it's not just what your traditional, you know, job fairs and things, those are all great too. You know, it's, it's like, it, but it could also be, you know, in your social life and your uh, personal life, it could be in a number of uh, forums where you make connections on some basis, and then that sort of leads you to the next thing. So um, I would definitely highlight that quite a bit. Ali, I, I don't know, um, do you want to jump in with 
some words. Yeah, I think, I think the importance of networking is great. And that doesn't necessarily mean networking for um, just people in the business. Like you never know who they know, who can recommend you. So it's not always like, you know, they need to be in the business to be someone that can refer you. Um, but that is a, how I got a lot of my jobs within the entertainment space and all sort of by chance. So I think that's important. And then I think it's really important to, to take on, even if a role doesn't seem like it's a hundred percent what you want to do, or it's something that, you know, is really entry level, maybe it's a little scrappy and maybe you're just doing some, a lot of assistant work and running errands or whatever you're going to be doing. Like, I think it's important to say yes and take those roles and um, opportunities because you never know what it could lead to. If anything, it will say, you know, might let you know, like, I really don't like this. Like, maybe I have to pursue another avenue. And that's also giving you more clarity into what you do want to do. So um, always say yes. And then um, I think internship opportunities are great. <laughs> um, I think that gives you a good place to really learn the business um, and understand what jobs are out there for you because you know we it is hard when you're first getting into things um to figure out you know you, you've heard about some of the somewhat like you know development or production or post-production uh, but there's a lot of other jobs um within entertainment that could suit your needs or be interesting to you that you just haven't heard of yet so i think internship opportunity gives you more exposure to the business and the company as a whole, um, while also getting good um, day to day work experience as well. So um, we do have an internship program for students um, and we are looking into finding other ways to um, help with early career development and building, um, you know, or developing talent um, outside of just the internship program. But for now, um, we just piloted our first internship program last summer. We're gonna do it again this summer. Um, and then kind of continue working on how we can do more outreach to help with early career development. So I think that's my advice. <laughs> well, um, thank you all so much. I wanna be conscious of our time for being here. Thank you all so much for your incredible advice. Um, if anyone wants to share this, I, we will, I'll have my team um, edited and we'll put it on our YouTube so that we can share this very valuable information and all of your incredible advice. So thank you so much Hasbro E1 for being with us and thank you for this incredible session. So have wonderful days and um, happy holidays. Thank you guys. Thank you. Thank you. Happy holidays. Thank you all so much. <laughs>